Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time again for your weekly Lovecraft, and this week we're going to be looking at Dreams in the Witch House, which I know is a favorite of some of you, and I count myself among that number. I think this is a very effective horror story with science fiction elements, and I want to talk about some of the cool things that I think exist in this story, and some of the great techniques that Lovecraft uses in order to achieve his effects. There's going to be spoilers in this, just so you know, right off the bat, uh, so if you don't want those, you can go read the story instead of watching this particular video, read it, and come back and hear what I have to say about it, and uh, then give me your thoughts down below, of course. I like to, to see what other people pull out of uh, these particular stories, because there's so much going on sometimes. Now, one of the first things in, in, in talking about technical aspects of the story is that it's written in a third-person perspective, whereas lots of his stories are written in a first-person perspective. And this story actually exhibits one of the strengths of writing in the third-person perspective, which is that the audience never knows who's going to survive. They never know what the outcomes are. If you're writing in a first-person perspective, at the very least, you can assume that the narrator survives on some level. But if you're in a third-person perspective, you don't know if the protagonist is going to live or die. And indeed, Lovecraft actually kills the main character, Gilman. Uh, and seemingly after the plot has resolved, Gilman gets killed. And it's a big surprise and it's very, very effective and one that actually couldn't have been pulled off in the first person. He could have written it from the first person with Elwood, who's a side character, but it wouldn't have worked. Uh, because a, a lot of the story is focused on Gilman being very isolated and alone, and having the narrator just a little bit detached from him makes the description of what's going on, I think, all the more uh, interesting. Uh, rather than having some kind of element where there's a, an unreliable narrator, what we instead get to focus on is the descent into madness. You've heard me talk about that before. So the descent into madness is very, very strong in this particular one. It starts starts off with this main character, Gilman, and he's a student at the university in Arkham. He's studying mathematics, and he's also very interested in folklore. And his interest in folklore comes down to, to an idea that um, I'm not sure how to describe it, uh, but it's an idea that was popular in the early 20th century, which is that you know, folk ideals and religions express some fundamental deeper truth that science is discovering. So that's the basis of his interest in folklore. And as the story progresses, he becomes more and more able to conceive of and then possibly enact interdimensional travel. That is, traveling through extra dimensions to, to traverse wide spaces of distance, travel to other planets, things like that. So that's a sci-fi element that, that's brought into this horror story that I think makes it all the more effective. The main character is profoundly interested in these ideas, but becomes horrified once he learns the truth of who exists in these interdimensional spaces and what uh, what the horror of the reality that is veiled behind ours actually is. So Gilman, because of his interest, he uh, rents a room. And he rents a room that has a particular folklore attached to it, having to do with this witch that was executed in the witch trials and her strange monkey-like familiar that follows her about. And the room is full of odd angles. And what Lovecraft does is he constantly describes that the angles are all off. And if you look about the room that you're in, and I'm in a basically a square box, all of the angles are 90 degrees. And maybe you have a room with like a vaulted ceiling, in which case you might have like some 45 or 30 degree angles, rather than having all of the angles be off so that nothing is properly symmetrical. That's actually a disturbing thing. I don't know if you ever walked into a space that has all of the angles being off, but I have. Um, they've done it, I've seen it in like architectural museums and things like that, that you're, you become keenly aware of the math, lack of mathematical proportion in, space, uh, in spaces when there is no mathematical proportion, when they, the, the ceiling slopes at a weird angle. It can actually be very off-putting, and um, Lovecraft does a very good job describing it continually in this story, giving you more and more pieces of what's going on with this strange loft that he's renting that has an empty space above it that no one will go into. Um, fundamentally, the story after this introduction transitions into a kind of ghost story. Uh, 
And I mean a ghost story or a a witch ghost story that is typical of American folklore in particular. So if you're not from the United States and you're not from, I would say, the mid or southern United States, uh, you have these legends like the legend of the Bell Witch or the story of the Bell Witch, which actually I think Andrew Jackson came to the house where the Bell Witch was and like left terrified. Uh, and he was a U.S. president. The Bell Witch was a witch who was killed at some point and continued to haunt this family through her ghost. So we have this witch that is assaulting Gilman, even though she's been murdered. So we, uh, to me, it's very reminiscent of the Bell Witch and other witch stories, including um, including one I've written that I haven't actually published yet. So maybe that horror story will be published next year or or something like that Um, but that's something very american is this idea of dead witches haunting you and that is fundamentally what the story is about on a on a a basic level however this science fiction element that's added into it really takes the horror to a new level where this witch is transporting him through these strange spaces where there's these polyhedrons following him in these bubbles and they're taking him to strange planets uh, he originally thinks and then as as things are slowly uncovered he realizes it's taking him into other rooms maybe other dimensional parts of the same room uh, to other parts of town and he's witnessing these these horrible acts and being controlled by these people who worship uh, Azathoth some unspeakable horrible evil at the center of the universe Uh, it it continues to get deeper and deeper into his levels of madness. Now, what goes along with this descent into madness is what I call the unbeliever. So Gilman is a character archetype that I call the unbeliever. And I've talked about this in a couple of pieces of content. The unbeliever is somebody that when confronted with the supernatural disbelieves it. So the first thing he does when he is being attacked by this witch is he doesn't believe it's real. He thinks he's stressed out from classes. He starts coming up with lots of rationalizations for his supernatural experience and refuses to believe it. He does things like spread flour on the floor because he thinks he's sleepwalking. He wakes up with like blood on his wrist from being attacked by this monkey creature. And so he thinks that a rat bit him in his sleep. And of course, he's imagining the whole thing. So a big theme in the story because of this use of the unbeliever character archetype is a profound confrontation between those who believe in the supernatural and are faithful and are therefore preserved. So you have these foreigners, like uh, they all have kind of uh, Eastern European names like, you know, Markowitz and stuff. They are all uh, devoted Catholics or, you know, they're they're French Canadians. So they're really devoted Catholics that are praying about them all the time. And uh, even though they have flaws, like they drink too much and, and things like that, ultimately they're they're going to survive the encounter because they believe it's real. They believe that they see the violet lights up in the loft and believe he's being attacked by the witch. They give him a crucifix. You know, one of the characters gives him a crucifix to try to protect him from uh, this witch. And the main character, Gilman, just doesn't believe it. He constantly taking off the crucifix because he doesn't believe in the power of faith, whereas these other characters do. And as a result, they end up surviving. Now, what's interesting about the crucifix and the unbelievers that the unbeliever always comes to a point in the story where he has to either believe what is incontrovertibly true or he has to continue in his delusion and die and in this case he comes to this this point where he has forgotten to take off the crucifix the witch assaults him and carries him through this other dimension and she shows shows him this baby that she's going to murder And he strangles her to death with the crucifix. And at that moment, he has to become a true believer. But because it's so horrific, what he's been denying for so long is so horrific with the death of this child. He has a psychotic break. So it essentially breaks him. So even though he becomes a believer, he also, in a sense, doesn't survive because he has this psychic break. The doctor comes and visits him, gives him some sedatives. And then after that has resolved, he dies. This crazy monkey familiar comes in and eats his heart out and none of the other people in the house uh, are able to prevent it or stop it. Uh, But that 
becomes the end of the witch that becomes the end of the torment and everybody's so frightened by it they leave the house and they you know they never come back then we have um this is a, another bit of, of technical structure we have a long uh what i would call falling action or something we have a long set of resolution uh, prose that describes what happens afterwards where they're finding the skeletons and that's important um, the last few pages of the of the story are focused around the falling down of this ancient house where the witch lived and the finding of these uh, human bones her bones and her corpse the bones of the of the baby who she murdered but also a heap of human baby bones meaning that she murdered babies over and over again because part of the story is this folkloric idea of babies being taken on may day on the first of may which is a, a kind of a witch's sabbath in the story so all of that is there to confirm to the reader that what gilman was experiencing was in fact reality and uh it wasn't that the narrator should be not believed or something like that it was really that uh, to inform you and, and just kind of let the, the reader know that Gilman was wrong to disbelieve. Gil, everything Gilman was experiencing was real, that the witch was real, the murders were real. The black man who was trying to get him to sign his book in, uh, sign his name in the book of Azathoth and become a servant of this uh, primeval being, um, all of that is real. And that's that's to let you know and it, it's quite a horrific feeling even though it's explained very calmly um it it's quite a horrific feeling that you know that he wasn't actually insane because that's part of the descent into madness is you don't know at a certain point whether what you're experiencing is reality or not as things get stranger you would think that gilman what gilman is described as experiencing has got to be hallucinations but that last part of the book lets you know no, it was not a hallucination. It was real. So that is <laughs> Dreams of the Witch House or Dreams in the Witch House. It's a really good um, H.P. Lovecraft horror story with those sci-fi elements relating to interdimensional travel, travel to other planes, travel um, through a dimension to other planets. Those little sci-fi elements really add a cool dimension to what is otherwise an American witch story. And I, th I think it's a great effect. Um, so let me know what you think about it down below in the comment section. I'll be interested to see um, whether this is one of your favorite stories or not. I do, by the way, like the pacing on this. Um, it's completely through composed. There's no scene breaks. Uh, I did this with my last book, Voices of the Void, and that has a cool effect as well. So thanks so much, and I'll see you guys next time.